Good afternoon uh, slash evening, everybody. My name is uh, Nira Zukovic, and I'm the director of the Applied Ethics Center at UMass in Boston. Uh, and uh, this is a talk in our uh, series that is um, uh, co-organized and sponsored uh, with uh, the Institute for Ethics in Emerging uh, Technologies, the uh, IET. We are uh, focusing this uh, semester and uh, this year, in fact, on some questions around uh, the future uh, of work and technology and the future of work. And our guest today is um, Professor uh, Peter uh, West. Welcome, Peter. Um, Peter is an assistant professor of philosophy at the New College uh, of Humanities uh, in London. His uh, research focus is on uh, early modern philosophy and um, the history of early uh, analytic philosophy. Uh, about a year ago, uh, Peter wrote a uh, wonderful essay in uh, the Institute for um, in the IAI uh, uh, website um, uh, on uh, whether we should or shouldn't uh, be excited about the metaverse. So his uh, talk today is called um, should we plug into uh, the metaverse? Uh, so, uh, Peter, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, right. Hopefully that's visible. Great. Um, yes. So th so thanks so much for for having me. Um, as you said, um, I primarily work in philosophy's history. So I'm used to talking about the past. Um, so it's nice to not only be talking about the present, but talking about the future um, this evening or this afternoon uh, where you are. So, um, so yeah, so this is kind of based on a couple of things that I've, that I've um, written about the metaverse. And I guess you'll see that reflected in the structure of the talk. Um, so that, so the, so the kind of, Quite title question is quite broad, um, but yeah, should we should we plug into the metaverse? Um, I should say from the start, I don't have a, a definitive answer to that. I guess in the thing I wrote for for the IAI, the answer was leaning towards no, and so I've tried to be at points a little bit more um, of a yes person, but we'll we'll see how that pans out. Um, so. Just to, to to give you a sense of, of what I want to talk about, um, that that's that's the uh, really exciting news of a few months ago that um, our avatars in the metaverse will have legs now. Um, that's the the thing I always think about when I think about the metaverse. Now that that was uh, newsworthy information. Um, so the two things I want to talk about, um, I guess, are. The, the metaphysical side of things. Um, so particularly questions about, uh, well, the kinds of questions that we might ask about reality um, in light of developments in regard to metaverses and virtual uh, worlds. And then the second thing is, is, a, is a set of more applied um, questions, at least that's the way that I thought best to characterize it. So more specifically, um, the first half of what I want to talk about is um, making the case for thinking that, uh, or thinking about the impact of the metaverse and or, or sort of metaverse adjacent virtual worlds on um, the way we think about the notion of reality. Um, and, and, and I guess what I want to, if I'm arguing for something, what I'm arguing for is thinking that what the metaverse could do is usher in uh, what we might think of as a paradigm shift in our understanding of reality. So that's the first thing I want to do. And then I'll move on to the more applied side of um, the talk, which is, so, so that'll be um, thinking about some, some issues surrounding that, more directly relating to that question of whether we should um, plug in. Uh, and hopefully this th these will look like two related issues by the end of the talk rather than two completely different strands of thinking. Okay. So thinking about the metaverse and reality. 
so I guess I sh one thing I should say from the start is um, a lot of the way that I'm thinking about this um, is, is kind of informed by this recent book from David Chalmers, um, which I guess is probably the most extended or sustained treatment of discussions of virtual worlds from a philosopher, at least to my knowledge. Um, so that came out earlier this year. Um, and and just to just to say from the start, what Chalmers argues in this book is um, that a virtual world is a real world. So um, he's trying to dispel uh, what he thinks of as a myth that if a world or if something is virtual, then that means it can't be real. Um, but I'll, but I'll say a bit more about that in more detail. But just to begin just because because I'm thinking about um, the relationship between uh, the metaverse and what and reality, whatever that refers to. I think um, there's this distinction that, that Chalmers draws uh, in this book, which I think is really helpful just to, to begin with. Um, and that's between two ways of using the term reality. So the first way is as a noun. So if, if Reality, when you use it as a noun, I guess means something like the world or everything that there is. Um, and since it's a noun, when you use it like that, it's something that you can say things about. And then the other way of using the term reality is as an adjective. So that when you use the word reality in that way, uh, you're you're using it or you're referring to a property that we ascribe to things or don't ascribe to things. So you, in that sense, you say something has reality or does not have reality. Um, and I guess that's that's more of a kind of literal way of using that word. So I guess reality means something like realness, um, a property that things do or do not have. Um, and I guess the thing to just flag up before I start getting into this is um, I'm mainly interested in the second way of using the word. That's so. So I'm thinking about um, the impact that the metaverse might have on our way of thinking about this property that we ascribe or do not ascribe to things. Okay. Another bit of sort of groundwork for for what I want to um, make the case for this notion of paradigm shifts. So. It comes from uh, this 1962 text um, about the history of science uh, from Thomas Kuhn. So Thomas Kuhn, uh, as he puts it, sets out in this text to change our image of, of how science works, uh, of what scientific progress looks like. Uh, and, he, and he's gonna do that by examining the history of science. So what follows in the structure of scientific revolutions is a descriptive case for thinking that scientific progress um, does not follow a kind of linear teleological trajectory, but instead consists in um, this movement between three stages. When I say a descriptive case, um, what I mean is that, that Kuhn doesn't really present um, kind of philosophical arguments for this view. It's rather um, it, the way his case works is, well, let's look at how science has progressed in the past uh, and, and we'll see what kind of what's the best way of describing that um, and the three stages of a paradigm shift uh, or a scientific revolution according to Kuhn uh, are these so you have um, you have an initial paradigm uh, you have something called a crisis or crises, and then you have uh, a revolution uh, or a paradigm shift. Um, no, obviously, like in this book, there's a lot more going on than that, and that might be a kind of slightly simplified account of things. But those are the kind of notions that I'm interested in here. Um, and just to say where this is all going is that I think this idea of a paradigm shift is something that can be helpfully imported into other um areas of thinking beyond just the history of science. Um, but yeah, so, so a paradigm is a set of shared assumptions or what we might think of as the backdrop to inquiry. So in relation to science, um, according to Kuhn, most of the time, a bunch of scientists are 
working with a set of shared assumptions, a set, a set of shared research questions, um, which they're all trying to answer. Um, that is until a crisis occurs, um, and a, cri a crisis is the result of an anomalous phenomenon uh, that threatens to undermine those assumptions. And then if a crisis is serious enough, if a crisis in that paradigm is serious enough, then a revolution occurs or a paradigm shift, which is where the original set of assumptions are replaced by new ones. So the examples that, that, that Kuhn is talking about in the history of science are things like the, the shift from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics, for example, um, or the Copernican revolution, um, that kind of stuff. Okay. So, so, so that's all meant to be in the, when, when Kuhn's writing that text is in the context of the history of science, but the notion of paradigm shifts has since then uh, been usefully employed outside of the history of science. So for example, another book from this year, um, very different book, but from uh, Benjamin Lipscomb uh, about, and it's a book about the wartime quartet. So four women philosophers, um, writing in the middle of the 20th century, based in Oxford, largely, um, sort of all loosely speaking, interested in ethics. Um, none of that is particularly important for, for my current purposes. But here's just something that, that Lipscomb is arguing for in that book. And so, so here's just the case of the notion of a paradigm shift being used in a different context. So Lipscomb says, uh, what they accomplished, these four thinkers, involved uh, an imaginative leap outside of what their contemporaries and predecessors thought. Maybe some great imaginative leaps happen all at once. More commonly though, as Thomas Kuhn describes and illustrates, people first raise new questions about a dominant paradigm, freeing their audience to consider that it could be wrong. Next, others begin to try out alternatives. The leap outside the picture that captivated philosophers in the first half of the 20th century a picture, it's, this is just some details about the, the paradigm that these thinkers kind of caused to, to, to go into crisis, according to Lipscomb, is one in which facts and values had little to do with each other. That was a kind of leap. It was a paradigm shift. So, I mean, one thing I think is nice about the, the language that Lipscomb uses here is this idea that paradigm shifts involve leaps in imagination, you know, jumps from one picture of things to another. Okay. And in the, in the rest of the first half of this talk, I want to make the case for thinking that the metaverse and other virtual worlds, but I guess let's just stick with the metaverse for the time being, might be enough to usher in a paradigm shift when it comes to our assumptions or, or our current paradigm about reality. Okay, so just to, to get started thinking about that, here's... Um, part of an interview with David Chalmers in the New York Times from either earlier this year or last year. So I, I won't read out the whole thing, um, but, but in fact, what I'm really, the part of this, this passage this is from the New York Times with interviewed to Chalmers being interviewed by, I think it's pronounced David Marchese, I might be wrong. Um, but the bit I'm interested in is actually what the interviewer says at the beginning here. So um, this is, it responding to the idea that, that I introduced a moment ago, so Chalmers' claim that virtual worlds will be real worlds, or maybe are real worlds. And, and the interviewer says, so, so what you know, he's kind of thinking, how how realistically, how realistic is realistic is it that people generally will think of these worlds as real? And he says, it, it's not so much about resisting changing from one format to another. It's about a fundamental belief about what reality consists of. And you're positing, that is Chalmers, that people will just switch modes of thinking and belief which are based on that fundamental reality. I may be a Luddite, but that switch seems like it could be a pretty big leap for some people. Um, okay, so... The interviewer, David Marchese, is kind of resistant to the idea that people would take this imaginative leap. As I've said, the interviewer, um, it, it, the exchange, the interview is about the book Reality Plus, 
uh, Chalmers is, is there defending this view that virtual worlds either are or will be real worlds. So it might be that they're not sophisticated enough currently, but maybe they will be. I mean, just to give you um, kind of a snapshot of, of what Chalmers thinks. So here's a passage from the book. Virtual realities are different from non-virtual realities. Virtual furniture isn't the same as non-virtual furniture. Virtual entities are made one way and non-virtual entities are made another. Virtual entities are digital entities made of computational information or processes. More succinctly, they're made of bits. That's the, the technical term. Uh, but they're perfectly real objects that are grounded in a pattern of bits in a computer. When you interact with a virtual sofa, you're interacting with a pattern of bits. The pattern of bits is entirely real, and so is the virtual sofa. So that gives you a flavor of, of Chalmers' view. And I guess the important takeaway is just because something is virtual, that doesn't mean it's not real. So I guess um, Chalmers', Chalmers view is that there's a predisposition to, to think of virtual as meaning something like not real or unreal. So of course, Chalmers' view and what seems radical about it is that it, it challenges either one longstanding preconception or maybe a, a longstanding set of preconceptions about what it means for something to be real. Um, and it's probably worth saying that given Chalmers' like work in the philosophy of mind, which is kind of his main area of expertise, this isn't particularly surprising. So he's one of a number of thinkers who are opposed to the kind of naturalist um, position, uh, which people call physicalism, right? The view that anything real is ultimately reducible to something physical. And then the implication of that in the context of philosophy of mind is thoughts, ideas, sensations, all, uh, if they are real, must be reducible to something physical, which is a view that Chalmers is opposing. Um, but just, just to give you an idea of what philosophers think about this. So this is from a, a survey of um, lots of philosophers that took place last year um, on a website called, called Phil, the Phil, it's called the Phil Papers Survey. Um, so they were asked a bunch of questions. And one of them was, when it comes to the mind, are you a physicalist or a non-physicalist? And 56.5% of philosophers said they accept or lean towards physicalism. So it is the dominant view, even though it's not the the it's not the only view. It's not universally accepted, but it's that would suggest that it's enough to be st still it's still and still popular enough to be called the paradigm view or the paradigmatic view about how it should understand the mind, for example. So physicalism remains the prevailing view. But one thing that seems relevant when we're talking about, about paradigm shifts is that it isn't always clear how philosophical the reasons for being a physicalist are. So, for example, um, and what I say, what I mean when I say not they're not the reasons for being a physicalist don't always seem that philosophical is they don't always seem like the product of an argument. They seem like um, the best bet, for example. So this is just a passage from. Um, a book from from E.J. Lowe talking about personal agency. Um, again, it doesn't matter too much the wider context of here, but what he says is this is this is any so in any time a situation arises in which we want to understand a physical phenomenon. Uh, Lowe's claim is well, a scientist would always appeal to some other physical phenomenon. So, any scientist who was to examine the situation by empirical means but who was restricted by means of his investigation to observing only purely physical events and causal relationships would naturally come to the conclusion that the physical event had a complete and wholly physical causal explanation. I guess the, the, the takeaway point there, and, the, and there's other pieces of writing where, where this seems to be the case too, often the main reason for being a physicalist in the context of philosophy of mind um, is because well that's that's what that's what scientists do they they think everything is physical so as philosophers we should do the same thing so what's what's relevant in terms of this talk of paradigm shifts is well like a Kuhnian scientist like the scientists that Thomas Kuhn is talking about 
it seems as though, at least on this issue, philosophers' views are influenced by sort of extra, i.e. outside of philo philosophy concerns. Um, and, and that's going to make them more susceptible to crises or revolutions. Obviously, so I said, so I said I, I, I'm in the most, most of my life, I'm a, a historian of philosophy. And I just wanted to give a sense of like the historical backdrop to this. Um, so, so I did my PhD on, on Barclay, an 18th century Irish philosopher who argued for a view called immaterialism. So, or, or sometimes referred to as idealism, which is roughly speaking the view that, um, well, Barclay's view is that matter does not really exist and that reality is at bottom uh, mental, something something grounded in the mind. Um, so, so Barclay was, was somebody who a bit like David Chalmers could be thought of as trying to usher in a paradigm shift when it comes to what we mean by reality, um, although kind of largely seen as unsuccessful in having done that. Um, and I think there's the, 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 this is an example of, of a famous um, response to Barclay, which shows that the reasons for thinking that reality is something physical are often not particularly philosophical. So perhaps the most infamous objection to Barclay came from uh, a man called Samuel Johnson, kind of 18th century British public intellectual, who, the story goes, went to a lecture on Barclay left the lecture hall, one of his companions said to him, well, look, Barclay's view is outlandish, but the arguments are irrefutable. And infamously, uh, Samuel Johnson apparently responded by kicking a stone, sort of emphasizing its solid physical nature and saying, I refute it thus. But of course, that isn't a particularly good uh, philosophical argument against, or, or kind of reason-based argument against Barclay's view. What Barclay was trying to do was, was basically reconceptualize what we mean by reality. Uh, and it seems like an, a, a genuine refutation of that demands more than just an assertion to the contrary, which is effectively uh, what Johnson is doing. So physicalism may have a long history, I think, you know, someone like Johnson is an example of that. It may be a prevailing view amongst philosophers, but that might be a result of something more contingent than reason or whatever it is that philosophers like to think is where we get our uh, opinions from. In other words, it, you know, why we think uh, a particular philosophical view sounds plausible is not always for, not always down to philosophical reasoning. So. Chalmers, for example, points out that um, when, when Descartes is, is thinking about the idea that um, all of reality could be an illusion, um, a result of an, of an evil, all-powerful evil demon, um, it was always a relatively far-fetched notion for Descartes. Whereas Chalmers thinks, well, it's, it, if Descartes were around today and he could see that possibly there are AI systems capable of simulating consciousness, maybe it wouldn't be such a far-fetched position. Sort of relevant to this, I, I, I went to see a talk at the Aristotelian Society um, a couple of weeks ago, and there, um, Jesse Munton, who works on kind of modal philosophy, so philosophy of possibility, there she argued that our modal claims are restricted by what we've previously experienced. So a modal claim is a claim about what is possible or what could possibly exist, that kind of thing. And, and she picked out this example of um, the first the first woman to run a marathon, Bobby Gibb, who was told by people around her, women can't run a marathon. And, and the thing that Jesse Munson said is, well, they were obviously wrong, but I guess their claim there about what's possible was, was arguably informed by the fact that they had never seen or heard of a woman running a marathon. So, so the kind of wider point there is something like, well, maybe our claims about what reality could be like are in fact restricted and perhaps illegitimately so by our current experience of what things seem to be like. And I guess this is where the impact of the metaverse might be quite significant. So up until now, the only types of things that have seemed real to us are physical things, arguably. But maybe 
when it becomes the case that things online seem more real to us or feel more real to us, maybe our preconceptions about what reality is might change along with them. So I guess the paradigm shift would look something like this. So our current paradigm is one where this notion reality uh, picks out things that are grounded in the physical. The crisis or the anomaly that's going to kind of bring that paradigm into question would be one where maybe maybe now, maybe in the future, where the metaverse and other virtual realities start to feel real to us or seem real to us. That might be, for example, when they start to mean something to us. That's something that Chalmers thinks is really important. Um, if we start to value the lives that we're living in virtual realities, then maybe that's going to be a good case for thinking these are real, real lives. And I think that's the kind of idea that this is a Max Kahn Hayward writing in the New Statesman, so not in the context of philosophy, but he says, well, the era of the metaverse will begin when online worlds are the place that you go to find the people you want to see. So maybe maybe it'll start to feel like that's where our lives are if more and more people are, are uh, plugging in. And then I suppose the paradigm shift, if somebody like Chalmers is right, for example, would be to, to a paradigm where reality need not be grounded in the physical. Um, so, so Chalmers himself picks out um, five other criteria for, for what, what some you know, criteria that must be satisfied if something can be said to be real. Um, I, I mean, I can say a bit more about this later if, if people are interested, but he says, you know, something's got to re something's got to exist, which is a bit vague. Something's got to have causal powers. Something's be, got to be mind independent, non-illusory and, and genuine. Just that's just another passage from the interview. But the footnote there um, is where those five criteria are set out. OK. So that's kind of the first the first part of the talk. Now, moving on to kind of a more more applied set of questions, and I guess more directly thinking, well, that's what it might mean, but but should we plug it? So I think a good a good question to start with might be something like this. Um, okay, so given what I've just been talking about, these kind of metaphysical questions that the metaverse um, raises, how salient um, to, to more applied concerns, and I guess more applied ethical concerns, is the metaphysical status of reality? And I guess that's a good question, because it, it, like, like I said at the beginning, it might appear that I'm just going off in two directions here, um, that, 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 that the two issues I'm addressing are somewhat unrelated. But I think that um, so something I talked about when I when I wrote about this before is is this thought experiment from Robert Nozick um, of the experience machine from the 1970s. I think that can helpfully bridge metaphysical questions about the metaverse and more applied and potentially ethical questions about the metaverse. So this comes from a book called Anarchy, State and Utopia. If people aren't familiar, the experience machine uh, we're meant to imagine that scientists have come up with a machine which if you decide to plug into it you will spend the rest of your life um, having simulated experiences that are th and, and your simulated life will be the most pleasurable life that you could possibly lead so um, if you're somebody who loves reading great literature or wants to be a novelist then that's what happened in, in that life for you if you're somebody who wants to win the world cup that's the life that you'll have simulated for you. And what's important is that when you're plugged into the experience machine, um, you don't know that you're plugged into it, right? So you're a bit like one of the people at the beginning of the, uh, the first Matrix film. With that scenario in mind, the question is, right, would you plug in if you were offered the chance? Should you if you're offered the chance? And Nozick says, well, look, the right answer is no, you shouldn't. And he gives three reasons for thinking that the right answer is no, or at the very least, the, the, the most intuitive answer is no. So one thing he says is, when we say that, that we have ambitions and desires and goals in life, what we mean is, this is his words, we want to do those things and not just have the experience of doing them. So 
his claim is look if you're if you're plugged into a machine that's simulating life you're not really doing anything similarly his second claim is when i express a desire to be a particular kind of person maybe a novelist or a world cup winner i'm expressing a desire to actually be that person and not as he puts it someone floating in a tank or if you like somebody sitting in a chair plugged into a machine and then the third claim he makes is or the third thing he thinks that should push us towards saying no when we're offered the chance to to plug into the experience machine is this plugging into an experience machine limits us to a man-made reality to a world no deeper or more important than that which people can construct okay what I think is interesting in the context of what I've just been talking about in the context of, for example, Chalmers' uh, views about how virtual worlds should be construed as real, I guess this raises the question, if somebody like Chalmers is right and we are going to and we will start thinking of virtual worlds as real, would those first two intuitions survive the paradigm shift? So this idea that i mean so that so both of these claims rest upon the assumption that the life you're living in the experience machine is not a real life you're not really doing certain things you're having simulated experiences of them but that seems to be the kind of assumption or background yeah background assumption that people like barclay uh, back in the day and chalmers um right now want to challenge When it comes to the kind of wider commentary about the metaverse, um, so, so in the public sphere more widely, for example, it seems to be this kind of third kind of concern, which is what people are really um, picking up on or something like it. So, so, so at the moment, this is the intuition that seems to trouble a lot of commentators. Um, I haven't done a kind of quantitative piece of survey of this. This is just things that I've happened to have read. Um, and actually, the, both of the ones I'm about to quote you are from the New Statesman. Um, but, but from the same piece that I mentioned earlier, Max Hayward says, perhaps a fully online life could be a good life, but for now it looks as though the first online worlds will be domains fabricated for profit by monopolistic tech corporations. In contrast, the physical world or I guess his point is the real world contains public spaces, parks, streets, and squares. But can any spaces be truly public in a metaverse owned by Meta or Alphabet or another tech giant? In another paper in the same outlet, uh, Sarah Manavis says, this situation where a megalo megalomaniacal tech billionaire reinvests the money earned by his successful enterprises into a futile vanity project may be an inkling of our future. Will our culture become a graveyard of expensive, financially non-viable technology, whether or not anyone else actually wants it? Okay, so both kind of negative outlooks on life in the metaverse coming from the perspective that the people in control of the metaverse or the people behind it um, are not particularly reliable or trustworthy individuals or corporations. And I guess this is, this is a similar point that I made when I was writing about this about a year ago. Um, so to quote myself, um, plugging oneself into the metaverse would involve plugging into, and this is uh, Nozick's words, right? A world no deeper or more important than that which people can construct. The people in question in the case of the metaverse are Facebook people. If it is true that Zuckerberg and his team care more about profit than people, so, so I was writing this um, in the aftermath of uh, a well kind of a whistleblower from from Facebook slash Meta um, who argued that what's driving all the Facebook initiatives is profit. So if that's true, we should seriously question whether we want to become part of a simulated universe that they have designed. Zuckerberg's rhetoric certainly suggests that the aim of the metaverse will be to bring us joy, but it might well be the case that this is not the aim of Zuckerberg's metaverse at all. And then I guess uh, thinking about the things currently on offer, in, thanks to people like Mark Zuckerberg, after all, how many of us seriously enjoy most, if any, of our online experiences today?
Although that might just be my experience. Okay, so the worry here seems to be that by plugging into the metaverse, we would be buying into a reality of Mark Zuckerberg's devising. That's that picture there. That's that's his avatar for the metaverse. Um, so that's that's the the ruler of the metaverse there on the right hand side. More formally, the argument seems to be something like this. One should not opt into man-made worlds. The metaverse is a man-made world. Therefore, one should not opt into the metaverse. So that seems to be where this, this concern is coming from, or where these, these sets of concerns from various commentators is coming from. Now, as I said, I'm trying to be a bit more positive about things. Here's an initial concern with that line of argument. Um, well, I don't know how positive this is actually, but to push to push back against these 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 um, cases against plugging in. So, so that first premise, which says one should not opt into man-made worlds, in response to that premise, perhaps the legitimate question would be: Do we really have a choice whether or not we decide to plug into? Uh, the metaverse specifically or not. What do I mean by that? Well, so, so just going back to, to this, this comment from um, the New Statesman. So the metaverse is being where everything is um, private by virtue of the fact that meta itself is private, is being contrasted with um, the real world in which there are public spaces, um, things that, that, that corporations or individuals in power don't have a monopoly on. So he says that the, the physical world contains public spaces, parks, streets, and squares. I mean, I, it seems it seems plausible to me that you could really actually question the, the, the legitimacy or the accuracy of, of that claim, increasingly so. So, I mean, I was just recently reading um, The Years, which is a kind of autobiography autobiography of of growing up and living in France over a kind of 60 year period from Annie Ernaux who who won the uh Nobel Prize for literature um and and one thing that she says she's talking about now about living in Paris in the early 2000s and she says the places where the merchandise were displayed were increasingly spacious attractive colorful and spotlessly clean in contrast with the bleakness of metro stations, the post office and the public lycée, so the public schools, basically. So her point is that the things which are public, the things which um, are not part of um, private enterprise that are not profit, you know, geared towards uh, making profit, are increasingly spare, sparse and increasingly, um, for example, not well funded or not well taken care of. So, I mean, I guess a more general point that I'm getting at here. So, so the words that, that Nozick uses, right, he, he says, like, basically, avoid man-made worlds, man-made realities. Avoid worlds that are no deeper or more important than that which people can construct. And obviously, there's a very literal sense, unless um, something like simulation theory turns out to be true. There's obviously a literal sense in which we do not inhabit right now um, a world constructed by other people. But in a looser sense, but the, the, yeah, so there's certainly a sense, maybe a looser sense in which the above description could be applied to the world that we currently live in. So our systems, our cultures, our institutions, our laws are also to some degree, we might say constructed, or maybe a better term would be something like engineered or designed. Now, one reply to that might be, well, maybe the relevant difference is, is something like intention or something like what the starting point was. So the metaverse will have always been a, a world designed with a particular purpose, presumably. And, and if, for example, whistleblowers in Facebook are right, that purpose is making profit. Um, whereas our world is not, you might say. So there's maybe a difference. Although kind of as a response to the response, you might well then say, well, look, is it really true to say that the world we live in wasn't constructed with an agenda? You know, 
if you live in a capitalist society, lots of the infrastructure in place has a particular goal, which is to, to generate profit, right? Okay, so, so I did say that I, I was gonna try and be uh, a bit more positive, um, which, which you might think I've not been very successful in doing so far. Okay, so let's, but let's have a go. So let's assume that the, the response to Nozick's argument that I gave is successful, right? Maybe, the, maybe there isn't too much to worry about for that particular reason, at least. And let's assume that Chalmers is right. The paradigm shift will occur in the future. We will think of virtual worlds as real worlds. If that is all true, is there anything to look forward to? According to Mark Zuckerberg, um, what we have to look forward to is um, the metaverse's potential to make us feel closer to people. So this is um, the Guardian quoting him. Uh, we'll be able to feel present with people who are, physically speaking, remote from us. Like we're there, right there with people, no matter how far apart we really are. Okay, so that sounds like a good thing. That sounds like a plausibly, sounds like an advantage of the metaverse. Um, generally speaking, technology that makes us feel closer to loved ones is seen as a good thing. It's seen as popular. Things like FaceTime and Zoom and the pandemic made this particularly uh, evident, right? And let's also assume, okay, so, that, so, so that's, let's assume that Chalmers is right, that one day we're going to live in these virtual worlds. Right now, technologies like FaceTime and Zoom and so on can make you feel close to people temporarily, but also can, can also reinforce the feeling of distance or remoteness from other people. So for example, probably we've all had something like this experience. I'll have this experience when we're all, when we're finished here and I, and I log off later uh, this evening. So the experience of, you're, you, well, I'm not in a lockdown, but the experience of being in a lockdown, catching up with friends or family, and then later hanging up and, and it becomes very evident that you're not really with them. Maybe the, the metaverse, this, this, the idea of, of a virtual world will remove that feeling. So even if you're not kind of plugged in 24 seven, what it might mean is that you always have the option to, to, to be with people, to feel that you are with people. Maybe it's going to be like having a portal to your loved ones in the corner of your room all the time. So that seems like it could be a good thing. Although just, just a, one concern you might have is, is, is that desirable? I mean, speaking from my own experience, I don't necessarily always enjoy um, the kind of omni- contactability that that certain social media platforms um sort of force i mean I, they don't force upon me i guess i could choose not to be on the platforms but sometimes it feels like you're, you're always available or, or or should always be available maybe that's not always a good thing okay what about the what about in relation to work so so apparently bill gates um is predicting that most meetings will move to the metaverse within three years How should we feel about that? If, as, as Gates thinks is the case, as Zuckerberg seems to think will be the case, if workplaces or meetings uh, are moved into the metaverse, I guess one question that seems important is, are you ever really not at work? So the work-life separation is hard enough to sustain as it is. Um, for many lockdowns in which we were working from home and, and so on made that even harder to sustain. And I guess th thinking back to this idea that, that, uh, that a virtual world is a man-made world, um, might that be further exacerbated by the fact that virtual worlds are constructed by private individuals with profit-focused agenda? That seems like it could be something to worry about. Okay, so that doesn't seem great. Just to finish off though, just to, to, to give some, some hint of positivity, here's a specific example that I feel quite, conf could con con I feel quite confident could benefit my own work. 
and, it, and it's in relation to, to kind of co-authoring. So, so in the context of research, in the context of doing philosophy, I'm a big fan of working collaboratively with people, working with co-authors. Um, but if, if you've done co-authoring, if you've done this kind of work, then you know that it's got to be read the right type of person. On the one hand, there's kind of the, your personal relationships with people. Um, but even leaving that aside, you obviously need to be working with someone who has the right kind of expertise. And I guess what that means is that the point I'm making here, I think, could be generalized to other cases where expertise is important. So, I mean, personally, I would love to be able to kind of step into a room with my co-authors, no matter where in the world they are. Um, so to sit down at a virtual table and have a conversation rather than, for example, just working on a Google Doc or something like that. And it seems like the environments that are being sold to us um, in, in, in the kind of PR surrounding the metaverse might provide something like that. OK, so to, to, to kind of wrap up and, and bring some of this stuff together, it seems to me that these kind of considerations emphasize the importance of setting boundaries. But I suppose where the where the kind of more metaphysical concerns come in might be, well, if someone like Chalmers is right and a paradigm shift concerning what it means for something to be real or what it means for a world to be real is going to take place, that might not be so easy. So, so even you know, traditional physical boundaries uh, or, or traditionally physical boundaries might be the kind of thing that divide work from home. Right now, the start and end of a Zoom call might set the boundaries around a meeting, for example. But if the world of the metaverse comes to be seen as real, uh, I guess a, an important question seems to be, can such boundaries be maintained? OK, and I'll, and I'll finish with that with that question. And thanks very much for listening. Look forward to any questions that you might have. Excellent. So let's open it up to uh, questions. Uh, Chris. Um. Thanks, Peter, for a really interesting talk. Um, I think I want to leave the, I, I guess I, I want to talk about the paradigm thing. Um, I guess, because um, I'm not really sure that paradigm shift is something that applies to individual concepts. And the reason this is important is because at least in Kuhn's work, um, a paradigm is not just, um, you know, a gestaltish way of seeing, but it's a set of experimental techniques. Uh, it's a way of investigating questions. It is a set of shared assumptions, but there's much more than a set of shared assumptions. It's which problems are salient and which problems aren't to be taken seriously. It's a way of categorizing what counts as an anomaly and what doesn't count as an anomaly, as opposed to just a bad measurement that needs to be redone or maybe a measurement that can't be done and so on and so forth. I mean, in, in other words, a paradigm is, is much more holistic than just one concept. And the payoff of that is the thing that makes me worried about using it in the metaverse complex and uh, context. And this is, of course, the thing that was always most controversial about Kuhn, not that there are different ways of seeing and different assumptions, like, yeah, we change our concepts and stuff like that. That's 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 no problem. The, the problem came from the holism. And one of Kuhn's key claims is that the actual problems and the um, hypotheses in particular paradigms could not be translated into others. To this extent, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Kuhn was very much the 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 child, maybe uh, unacknowledged of of Quinean holism, right? There's an intertranslatability problem, and the metaverse, in some sense, doesn't seem like that. It's weird. It's different in the same way that, um, you know, David pointed out in the chat that telephones were different when they came in. Um, but there isn't a basic intertranslatability problem when I get in and out of the metaverse, right? Um, it's not like I can't, I, I simply can't translate what I was doing to what I was doing over there. Because frankly, at the end of the day, the metaverse is, is a different way of interacting with people. And the assumptions about the people haven't changed unless we're talking about bots. Um, yeah. 
But in general, like when I speak to my aunt in the metaverse, <laughs> it's going to be like speaking to my aunt in person. It's going to be different. There's going to be weird things about it. Maybe I'm afraid of it. Maybe I like it better. Maybe the fact that she doesn't have legs is actually a real improvement. But there isn't this holism part of the untranslatability from one paradigm to another. And the way that, you know, Kuhn made this quite clear is that a paradigm happens, a paradigm shift happens, not by people changing their ideas, but literally the old people dying off and the new people who are operating in another, uh, with another set of experimental apparatuses, another set of assumptions about what's important to be investigated and what can be backgrounded, right? Those people are just paying attention to different stuff and those old people die off. And it doesn't strike me that the metaverse, at least as I understand it, which is limited, um, has that kind of holistic inter untranslatability aspect that makes paradigm shift a, um, a, a powerful concept. So I guess I just want to ask about the, the metaphysical part of the, the talk and, and, and not maybe the practical part. Start off yeah, there. that's really interesting. Thank you. I, I I can't I can't see who you are, but 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 whoever you are, that's really interesting. Sorry, all I can see is myself at the moment. Um, but um, I get, Can I just? I, I have a couple of things I want to say, but can I just? So so would you say you think that untranslatability is a necessary criterion of a of a paradigm shift? Or yeah, maybe... yeah, because I think it's not just conceptual change. Hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. And that's really helpful. I guess, I guess just, just a couple of thought, this isn't really a direct answer to the question, but just a sort of couple of thoughts that that, that prompted in me. Um, so, so one thing I was thinking, which is interesting, based on what you said is, um, maybe, maybe you're right that it so, so one thing that's going to happen, well, that, that might happen if if uh, Zuckerberg and so on are right, is um, or or if or if David Chalmers is right, is so we're gonna if if we're gonna be constantly switching between the physical world and and the virtual world. Um, so I guess if, if those were two different paradigms, that 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 doesn't seem they wouldn't seem plausible to to describe those as paradigms because paradigm is not the sort of thing you can switch back and forth from. Um, so I guess just to, on a clarificatory point, I guess I wasn't trying to, and I don't know if this is necessarily what you were saying, I was saying, but just to be clear, I wasn't saying that I think that the physical world is one paradigm, a virtual world is another, and that's the shift that's going to occur or something like that. Because yeah, that, that would be weird because you could sort of constantly flick in and out of different paradigms i guess it yeah the paradigm is what is 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 one where we we're saying re reality means this and and it's going to go on to mean another thing um but yeah so i think i think that's your your i suppose i suppose it thinking about this idea that um our concepts are informed by uh, our previous experiences, which I guess is quite an empiricist way of thinking about concepts. Um, I, th I guess maybe you you, the, the, you could argue that the, the the new paradigm in which reality means something does does no longer means reducible to the physical or something like that. I guess there's a case to be made for thinking that somebody without access to something like the metaverse could not have construed reality in that way. I mean, I guess similar to the way that um, the example that Chalmers uses when he says somebody like Descartes could only have thought of global skepticism as, as a far-fetched thought experiment and not as something plausibly the case. Uh, I guess that, that maybe some, maybe you could make the case for thinking that um, that shift had couldn't have occurred at any point beyond before now or something like that maybe but i don't yeah I, I don't know i don't think that's the same as in translatability so i don't know i don't really have a direct answer to the question i think that's a that's a really helpful point um so peter i removed your uh spotlight so you should be able to see yeah, i can see that's great thank you uh jay and then uh david 
So <clears throat> one of the frequent things that we do at the IET is try to detranscendentalize technological questions by pointing out their continuities. And I think it relates to this question of whether this is a paradigm shift or not. <clears throat> For me, the metaverse is really in the continuity of us um, communicating with each other for millennia. People used to write letters to each other, uh, develop whole romances and relationships through writing letters to each other, organize revolutions through writing to each other. And that was just a low bandwidth form of communication. Then we had the telegraph, the telephone. Uh, now we have video communications. Um, I think that especially augmented reality is going to be just a continuity of that kind of communication, higher bandwidth, and that higher bandwidth does have uh, tangible consequences. But the connection I want to draw is that when you quoted the New Statesman, one of the things they pointed to was the lack of a commons or the, uh, the, the creation of public spaces. And mm -hmm. in the regulatory approaches that we've had with the FTC and the European regulators towards communications platforms. Um, they've been very anxious to, the Europeans at least, have been very anxious to use antitrust to make sure that you know, Windows allows non-Windows software, Apple allows non-Apple software. This is interoperability. And one of the things that we've been thinking about for our own uh, essay that we're trying to write about regulating the metaverse is the significance of protecting a metaverse commons so mm. that um, it, would, it would require some regulatory intervention, some antitrust intervention to make sure that all the players were existing within a common space and were playing nice with each other. And that would require some degree of commons, I think. Um, so I was just wondering if you thought that that was an answer to some of the uh, dystopian critiques of the kind of capitalist uh, nature of this future, a walled garden, uh, you're either a Google person or an Apple person kind of future, which most of us wouldn't want to live in. We want to live in a much more open-ended uh, kind of space. Thanks for that. Um, one thing I was just going to say in response to the, the, the first thing that you were saying about um, yeah, that's a nice turn of phrase, de, de transcendentalizing, but emphasizing the continuity of apparent leaps in technology. I mean, I, I think I agree, and I was kind of convinced by a book that came out recently from Justin Smith called The Internet, A History of Philosophy, A Warning, um, which is also a great book uh, in terms of using the history of philosophy to speculate about future technology, which is nice if you're someone like me who is, is kind of trying to do those things too um and and he, i don't think he talk he doesn't talk about the metaverse or virtual worlds but one thing that that book makes quite a convincing case for is thinking that the internet is not um some big leap it's it's you know it's got its roots in um i mean he talks a lot about Leibniz, uh the this but the idea of if, if if the internet is construed as something like a worldwide network of communication, then it's a much older idea than the second half of the 20th century. Um, so yeah, I think that, that um, and, and I also think, I, I don't necessarily think that, yeah, I don't think Kuhn would think of paradigm shifts as great leaps. It, so maybe that, maybe that, that language from the, from the other, from Benjamin Lipscomb, which, which was talking about great leaps, maybe that isn't the quite way, the quite quite the right way of thinking about it. Maybe the, the types of things that retrospectively seem like great leaps or something like that. Um, on the, sec the second point, uh, yeah, no, that, I mean, that's that's really interesting. Um, because I guess that that's a, that's an idea and a worry that is as old as the internet, right? Um, so the internet was, was meant to be a, a an alternative to a world which was increasingly owned by corporations um or at least according to some people it was that was that was the idea and and basically that that didn't necessarily go very well because like you know i guess someone like elon musk taking over twitter is exactly the kind of worry uh that the, the commentators i was quoting are are worried about you know but imagine that you actually lived in twitter that's that's basically the the kind of worry there um so i suppose 
it, yeah, probably it, it certainly, I don't know if it would necessarily change my views about whether I'm going to plug in, but it would definitely make me feel better if basically everybody did and all the jobs were on in virtual worlds. And so I felt like I had to. Yeah, that's great that, that, that there are people out there uh, trying to ensure that there's, there's like common public spaces. I guess, you know, the, the pessimist in me and the pessimist in various commentators would say, um, you know, the, the track record of like EU law against what private corporations like Facebook and Meta want isn't that great. Uh, so, but yeah, but I, so, so I, yeah, it might, it's probably not going to quell those concerns, but, it, but, it, but like, it definitely seems like the right thing to be thinking about at this point in time. Uh, David? Thanks. So my question follows on from James, I think. So Peter, it seems to me that your question was a bit too binary. Mm -hmm. Should we plug in or not? There's the short-term plug-in versus the long-term plug-in angle. I don't mind plugging in temporarily if there's a piece of work that requires me to do some training that's better done with a, a three-dimensional interaction rather than a two-dimensional interaction. That's the kind of thing, by the way, that PwC have been talking about. I went to one of their presentations a few weeks ago, their head of Metaverse saying, here are the use cases today for the Metaverse, including soft skills training, including taking part in remote tours when you can turn and have a look around. So I don't mind plugging in temporarily even today, but I wouldn't want yet to commit myself for years on end. So there's a time scale dimension. And then there's what we've just been exploring with James, whether it's a better verse created by a profit seeking entity versus one that is much more rooted in humanitarian. And you're quite right to point out the drawbacks of things like Twitter being taken over, but there are at least some positive examples. Microsoft's operating system Windows has in some cases been outcompeted by an open source Linux operating system, the most widely used operating system on the planet by some counts now. We've had Internet Explorer created for commercial ends, which is out competed by Firefox, and Mozilla, and open source, and then by Chrome. The uh, Wikipedia outcompeted Microsoft and Carter. The Mastodon or the Fediverse hasn't yet outcompeted Twitter and it's going to need some help, but it might be done. So you, most of your arguments seem to be you wouldn't plug into the Metaverse because it will be created for ulterior motivations. And I'm with you there. But I think that if you advance these discussions further, then you can get the EU politicians and other politicians woken up and being more constructive. And finally, there's another way in which your question may be too binary, which is, again, I wouldn't want to plug in to the metaverse permanently today, but in the future, I might be more willing to do so. If that metaverse in the future was created by extremely clever AIs and provided a safer environment, I may well imagine I'm gonna spend the rest of my life there. It's a possibility. In fact, some people say that's the best solution to the Fermi paradox. Where are all the aliens? You know, the, the universe should be full of aliens. Well, they've probably all gone into their own little metaverses, which are much safer places to be than the big bad outside world. And you can construct a, in very safe parts of space, uh, the computers where you could be confident you will be safe forever. Anyway, so I think some of your arguments may make sense today for being fearful, but in the future, it may be more positive. And finally, sorry, on this uh, Nozix experience machine argument. I remember reading somewhere recently, I don't know where, might have been on Twitter, that uh, a philosophy lecturer was saying that every year when he used to teach Nozix experience machine, the first year undergraduates, they would all come in and they say, yeah, sure, we wouldn't plug in. No, 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 it's false. But increasingly, the youngsters are saying, yeah, actually, what's wrong with this? Increasingly, the youngsters are having their ideas informed by their own appreciation of technology, their own experiences with what AI can already do. And they're saying, yeah, actually, what's wrong with having this uh, apparent failure? So I don't know if any of the other the rest of you who teach philosophy professionally, if you've had that experience with first year undergraduates or even later. Sorry, that's a range of questions, but uh, no, I, that, think that, I, th I think you've just opened a, a much wider set of questions. Good, I, I, that, that's good. There was a paper that, that came out today called, I don't know if anyone saw this, in, in the journal, I think it's in the journal Meta Philosophy called, can, can asking a question 
in and of itself uh this is a it's something like can asking a question in and of itself make a positive contribution to philosophy and that's that's all the publication was it was just the title which it which it, so so even if i've just even if i've just raised questions that's that seems like a good thing um yeah that that lot lot lo, like a lot of interesting stuff there and i think you i mean to the i guess the question was yeah uh i guess it's kind of knowingly too binary um uh, like like i wouldn't be a philosopher if my answer to that question weren't it depends right um so yeah i guess i guess what i'd say is so 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 that's really interesting about um so one of the things i was already going to say before you gave that last example is that it, it it seems plausible and i think there is empirical evidence to back up the idea that people's answers um to to the thought experiment question have shifted over time so there are various kind of experimental philosophy papers that have been written and but you know basically surveys that have been taken where they just ask a bunch of people and and it does seem to be the case that um i mean so 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 on that the that idea that the young people might be more inclined to to say yes um I suppose the, the way the what you were suggesting there is there's like a positive side that that's a positive well, well it's it's a positive in the sense that they feel they feel positive about the 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 potential of technology right they they don't I guess another side to that would be um you know like maybe our intuitions on this again are, are just informed by how much time we spend online or have spent online growing up right like the the nozick thing was written in the 70s i i won i mean even now it feels the fact that he so clearly thinks the answer to that question is no that doesn't that feels i'm not as confident as him and i doubt and I, so it doesn't surprise me that people 10 years younger than me do right i mean if you're i mean one thing i was thinking about in relation to this is so for example this idea that um this idea that you and what you want to the person you want to be is something clearly distinguishable from the you that is online i mean if you're if you're if you're somebody who grew up is growing up currently as a 12 year old and spends a lot of time on instagram or something like that i don't think that distinction is going to be very familiar to you actually I mean so for example if there's a great film called eighth grade about an eighth grader uh, I mean like I mean presuming assuming that film is accurate I mean it, I, don't, I don't I'm not an eighth grader so I don't know but so, so but I but I suspect that you know and I have a younger sister so I suspect that that distinction isn't something that would that would land with a lot of people who have grown up where where a really important thing is fostering your online persona right maybe maybe even to the, maybe even more important than than what you look like in real life you know we have instagram the instagram filters and all of that there's you know um well and, and i think that young people are also aware of that right there's there's memes that are that are out there all the time take making fun of the fact that people care more about their online personas and so on um so yeah that that's that that I guess what I was going to say, my sort of broad response to that to those questions was something like, um, okay, so so there's the idea that the, the the negativity for coming from commentators about um the impact that private corporations and individuals are going to have on these these virtual on the metaverse and so on, it actually doesn't doesn't stand up to what the reality of yeah what of all the examples that you gave that actually there are lots of cases where, um you know more benevolent corp benevolent institutions and organizations win out so then i think there's an interesting question about where where does the negativity come from then right um i guess it maybe maybe the answer is um what we hear more about i guess maybe it's just the you know there's far fewer news stories about linux being the most popular um operating system than there are about musk and zuckerberg and so on so yeah what's my general kind of general point that yeah the stuff that's going on around the reality of the you know the the the, the responses that the where the people's responses are coming from 
maybe is, is something interesting in and of itself, even if it doesn't match up with if we had the best evidence in front of us, how we should actually feel in, as informed by that evidence, if that makes sense. Um, Peter, if I, uh, if I could make uh, uh, three uh, comments or um, questions. Um, so one uh, has to do with uh, your um, conversation uh, with Jay uh, and this um, discussion of whether the metaverse uh, constitutes a uh, leap or whether we want to call that a paradigm shift or not, uh, or a kind of continuity. Uh, and I think there's um, two ways of thinking about that. Uh, one is the conceptual, uh, which uh, Jay and you uh, uh, engaged in, which is uh, if there's a conceptual kind of continuity between the two uh, activities, if they largely share uh, features, uh, then it is a continuity rather than a leap. But um, you could also ask the same question, uh, focusing on what the pragmatic implications and how dramatic the pragmatic implications of a technology are and ask if it's a leap uh, in that sense. And so the metaverse may not be a conceptual uh, leap, but if, for example, it has uh, massive implications in terms of de skilling, uh, it could um, still mm -hmm. be a, uh, a leap rather than a continuity. The kind of de skilling that I think that might be involved is, for example, interacting with people in a room, the features of which you didn't customize requires figuring out some kind of spatial intelligence, tact, how to place your body, et cetera, et cetera, all of which uh, are probably not relevant uh, uh, or less relevant in a highly customizable uh, uh, environment. So one comment is, um, in summary, that uh, whether or not it's a leap can uh, uh, be understood, the continuity could be uh, understood either conceptually uh, or pragmatically, and sometimes that would lead to different answers. Uh, the other uh, is a specific comment going straight back to uh, um, Chalmers and the question of the reality uh, of the metaverse actually uh, also um, connects to something that uh, David was saying uh, a few moments ago. So actually the best predictions right now are that much of the um, environments uh, of the metaverse will be created by uh, AIs, will be, will be created by uh, foundation models, by GPT-3s, et cetera. Uh, and uh, to the extent that that's a large, so, you know, instead of us meeting with these little squares, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of us uh, before the meeting would have a GPT-3 or a foundation model say, you know, create us a nice lyceum kind of uh, environment with olive trees outside and, you know, sheep and, you know, whatever. Uh, and then um, the question would be, if a lot of the metaverse actually was created by these uh, foundation models, um, would Chalmers' uh, uh, argument of reality uh, still hold? Because then it's not only that it's... Um, you know, sure, bits can be uh, as real as, uh, uh, you know, atoms of a different uh, kind altogether, uh, but they're both sort of intentionally created uh, in a human involved process. But if there's a foundation model that's creating the bits in the first place, then it takes it one step back from um, at least some ideas of reality. So those are my two mm. comments. Yeah. Well, so, so, so I fit the overriding, just to answer the second question first. Um, the thing, the thing that seems, the thing that seems the most important thing to me, or, or the thing that seems to really count as far as I can tell with Chalmers. So he does give these these five criteria um, for what it means to something to be real. Um, so the first one is existence. Uh, but I guess that's the same question. Um, there's the, there's a claim about causal powers. Um, and, and one thing he says is like, 
you know, you know, two thing, two virtual things interacting with each other counts as a thing, counts as an, an example of something having causal powers. So that's pretty permissible. Um, it doesn't even have to causally impact, doesn't even have to have a causal impact on you. Um, and the other, other ones are, yeah, mind independent. So if it's, if it's dependent on AI, it's not mind dependent. It's not, you know, it's not, S, it's not like uh, if I close my eyes, it goes away. Um, I mean, but, but what I was going to say, so there are those five criteria, but the thing, I feel like having having read Sharma's stuff on this, the thing that seems to be the most important thing to him is like, if if it has value to 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 a community of people, then it's then it counts as real. That, or if it's meaningful to a community of people, then it counts as real. So I think the the details of like exactly what the virtual objects or the virtual environments are grounded in is less important than the so I, so yeah than than what so I mean that I don't know this is an interesting question I guess like um for Chalmers would a virtual reality that nobody was plugged into would that count as real um or or and I I think his answer would be that it's got to be a it's got to be a reality for someone to be a reality which then makes it sound a bit quite idealist um in a way so 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 that's what i think in response to the second thing i don't know if i have a have anything particularly interesting to say um about yeah so so this idea that the pragmatic implications that could be the big that could be the big leap um yeah that that sounds plausible to me i don't know if i, I don't think i have anything particularly interesting to say about that but but thanks for the for the comments alec Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, so I, I unfortunately uh, uh, had to come in late for this. So you may have already addressed some of this, but at least I can I can ask you um, some questions. So um, in some ways, this is both a response to David's earlier point and then also James's point about um, regulation. But you know, I'm wondering if um, there's a kind of uh, there's a kind of hopefulness about this continuity idea that, well, you know, in a sense, this is a continuation of technological developments. And so we've been through this before. And so likely we can do this again. We just need the right regulatory framework or whatever. But, but I also think that is a, I mean, that is a huge, huge ask. And so, I mean, one of the problems with the current existing model of the internet is it's almost entirely dependent on the advertising model and data collection. And in the course of 20 years, we've we've almost just given up the concept of digital privacy. It just doesn't exist anymore. And maybe we've maybe that's us deciding collectively that it's not important, or maybe in a sense it was forced upon us because the corporations that were the ones at the forefront building the internet, that that was the model that that took off, right? Um, but then you know, associated with this entire model is um, even if, you know, you know, younger people are saying, yeah, we'd love to plug into the metaverse if we do Nozick's thought experiment. But also, we know that people are suffering from higher levels of depression. We know that, you know, there's uh, addiction problems with social media. We know that there's huge, um, uh, the attention economy itself is a huge driver of this. And you know, speaking anecdotally, my own students recognize that they are addicted to social media and wish they weren't, but recognize that it's just something that's that's happening and they wish they could get out of it. Right. Um, so I guess in some ways I want to say I don't want to plug into Zuckerberg's metaverse. <laughs> Maybe I want to plug into a different metaverse. And so I guess my question for you is with all of that in mind, what are the kinds of regulatory measures that you see, or what would be the kind of metaverse that you would be more comfortable plugging into, right? So what are the things that we need to attend to? Is it the advertising model? Is it, you know, does this need to be a publicly owned uh, metaverse for it to be something for us to be comfortable stepping into? You know, so I just want to get your thoughts on some of those questions. Mm, yeah. Um, great. Yeah, that's, I mean, so that's funny. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a difference between like thinking about these questions theoretically, right? Sitting here in this context. Um, 
but I'm the same as your students, right? I spend way too much time on my phone. I can't, I can't even look at my screen time app because it depresses me, but, but I, but it doesn't change my behavior. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty frequent user of Twitter. I probably love the metaverse. Like if I could go on and make like lame jokes with philosophers, uh, all the time, I'd probably do it like, but, but I don't think it would be right for me to do it. Um, I don't think it would be good for me to do it. Uh, so, so I, yeah, it, and that's kind of, I don't know, that's kind of, I, I find that kind of depressing. And maybe, maybe that's where the sort of, uh, the opposite, yeah, the, the, the negativity it comes from, from some people. Um, I mean, I, I, I feel like there's a, the, something that's like, uh, something that, that, something that it really feels, so this maybe relates to to this this you know the idea that actually the evidence suggests we should be a bit more positive about the, this potential the potential for these envir these online environments than we should be because like there are like kind of benevolent institutions you know, benevolently run things that that are doing quite well and it's not all about you know it's not all about Zuckerberg and so on um, but but I feel, so so I can't remember where I read something the other day and and it and it, and it just said like. Um, the, the gist of the article was something like, and, and I think it was about Britain actually. So maybe this is a British thing. And my and a friend of mine who's American said this, she, she thought this was a really British thing that if something feels inevitable, then for some reason we just end up approving of it. Um, and, and I kind of feel like that's, there's a relevant sentiment when we're talking about this stuff, right? Um, it's kind of like, I, maybe I, it's kind of like the way that I feel like discourse surrounding things like self-driving cars goes, which is a bit like, does anybody think it's a good idea? Does anybody think we need it? But we, but probably if you took a straw poll, most people think it's coming, right? Um, and it's kind of out of every, you know, it's out of each individual person's hands, really. Um, and and I feel like there's you know it's easy to feel the same way about this metaverse stuff, right? Like, um, I don't know what's my general point here. I guess like there's a disparity between what we think is what we think should happen or what would be right to happen, and and probably if we're honest, what we're going to do in the future, and and the way we're actually going to relate to this to this technology. Um, it goes back, Peter, to your point about the eighth graders before as yeah. well. The fact that they can't separate between their online self and their non-online self it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be a good thing to separate between the two selves. That's it. So, so I so that's what I was thinking. So, the example of 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 online data privacy is is the perfect example of this. I mean, I do i just click accept cookies pretty much all the time and i and i and i shouldn't do but like i don't have that hat on every time i go on a website you know i just have my i'm, I'm on my phone i'm wasting time i want to read that article i want to whatever um and then you you know then you you read something or you watch something about what that actually the implications of that for your data and for the wider world and so on but i think those things are so difficult to get in alignment um, so yeah, I think, you know, most people would like to have online data security, but, but if you can't feel the impact on it, it of it on your life on a day-to-day -day level, I don't know if, if it ends up moving you to act in a certain way or not. At least that's, I mean, that's purely based on my own experience, but. So I think we are, uh, slowly running out of time. I don't want to, uh, Peter, keep you here, uh longer and um, everybody else than uh, we had promised. This was really, really wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank, all for thank you so much for inviting me to, to be a part of this. Right. This, this was the last talk of our um, series this fall, but we will be putting this video up in our YouTube space and uh, we'll have a, another series in the spring. So stay tuned for that. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.